for our webinar, launching our new report, Israel State of Climate Tech 2023. We're really excited for this webinar. Uh, we working for this webinar for the last couple months. Um, so today in the webinar, we will, we will hear uh, the findings of our new report, uh, followed by six different climate tech startups from our ecosystem. Uh, I'm Gal Sharon, I'm the head of ecosystem development and operations at Planet Tech. Uh, and I will, be, I will be your host for today's webinar. We're really excited for having many people from the global climate tech ecosystem joining us today uh, from different countries and of course from COP28 in Dubai. Um, we will go over the agenda and we will start. Great. So um, we'll first hear opening remarks from Dro Bean, the CEO uh, of the Israel Innovation Authority, and Shanice Donesco, uh, the founder and chair at Planet Tech. Then we'll jump straight to the content of the webinar uh, to hear the new findings from the report and from the six different climate tech uh, startups that are addressing different climate challenges um, um, in our, uh, from our ecosystem. And in the end of the session, we will have time for Q&A. So please keep your questions for the end of the webinar. And we will open uh, the Q&A Q session to, uh, for you. And you can write your questions in the chat. Uh, so please stay with us. Uh, it will be really interesting. Uh, I, will, I want to say that the, the webinar will be recorded. And the recording will be uploaded for the Planet Tech website and the Israel Innovation Authority website. And of course, you will, be, you, you will get access to download the full version of the report in both uh, websites. Uh, I really, um, I think we can start. So I'm happy to invite uh, the first speaker for today, Dro Bin, the CEO of the Israel Innovation Authority. Thank you very much, uh, Gal. I would like to share a few slides. So hello, everyone. Uh, Happy to be here and to open uh, this uh, gathering, uh, presenting the findings of uh, the 2023 Climate Tech uh, Ecosystem uh, Report. Uh, obviously, we had other plans to be uh, these days in uh, COP28 uh, with a delegation of uh, the best climate tech uh, startups in Israel. We're also planning to have uh, a, a very uh, big event here with uh, Planet Tech in Tel Aviv. Unfortunately, uh, the war broke and uh, we are doing this only virtually, but it doesn't mean that we stopped uh, working. Israeli Climate Tech delivers no matter what, even in times of uh, war. And I will elaborate on that uh, in a moment. Just a second, problem with the slide. Okay, I hope that you can see. Uh, well, uh, maybe before I uh, dive into the climate tech ecosystem in Israel, just uh, a brief uh, context about uh, the Israeli high tech in uh, general. Uh, many of you, or all of you know that uh, Israel is known for its uh, tech ecosystem, uh, one of the leading tech uh, hubs in the world. But just to give you or to share with you a few figures uh, that uh, illustrate that. So first of all, Israel invests uh, more than 6% of its uh, GDP in uh, R&D. This is the highest uh, figure, highest percentage uh, in the world. And this is the case already for uh, more than two decades. Uh, Israel is ranked one, number one in terms of uh, R&D uh, investments. 12% uh, of the Israeli workforce uh, works in uh, the high tech. This is, again, the highest number in the world. Uh, about 9,000 high tech uh, companies uh, uh, work out of Israel. Uh, and this is the third place after the Silicon Valley and uh, the New York metropolitan area. We compare ourselves to either countries in our size, less than 10 million uh, population or uh, large metropolitan areas. So number three in the world, 18% of GDP uh, as a benchmark in uh, the US, it's about uh, half, uh, eight to 9% of GDP in the, the EU, it's about five to 6%. So again, uh, very different. And about 50% of Israeli export uh, is uh, out of the tech uh, sector. 
Uh, this is, uh, I think those numbers show why uh, the high tech is considered uh, the engine of the Israeli economy and why it's uh, so important. And this is also why the Israeli government is so determined to make, uh, to take all necessary measures to make sure that uh, the high tech continues to thrive even uh, during uh, war times. Uh, for those of you uh, from abroad who are not familiar with the Innovation Authority, Israeli Innovation Authority, our mission is to strengthen the competitiveness of the Israeli Innovation uh, Hub. Uh, we fulfill this mission in three ways. Uh, one, direct investments in uh, startups, in groundbreaking high-risk uh, tech-based uh, ventures, uh, in which the private sector is under-investing because of the high-risk uh, profile. We are looking for disruptive innovation, investing in those uh, startups. The second way is uh, preparing the local tech hub for the uh, emerging technologies, investing in applied research, in labs, in talent. So when the time comes and the technology matures, it will be available for uh, new ventures to be uh, founded here in Israel. And the third way is removing uh, growth barriers regardless whether it's regulation, taxation, human capital, just name it. Uh, once we identify a growth barrier, we reach out to the relevant uh, government ministry, agency, or academia, or industry, and we work out uh, together uh, the removal of, of this uh, growth uh, barrier. Uh, all in all, we invest uh, about uh, half a billion dollars every year in uh, either startups or uh, infrastructure, to make sure uh, that we strengthen uh, and sustain the com competitiveness of the Israeli Innovation Hub. Now, when it comes to uh, climate tech, uh, already uh, two years ago, we have uh, decided to uh, set uh, a very high priority uh, for the development of a climate tech uh, ecosystem in Israel. Uh, after analyzing uh, all the assets that uh, we have here, uh, just to mention a few, it's uh, uh, world-class uh, research institutes. Uh, you can see them on the left-hand side of uh, the slide. We have here a, vi a vital investment, very sophisticated investment community. And maybe above all, we have uh, great entrepreneurs that uh, those that uh, once you tell them that uh, this uh, problem is impossible to solve, you see the spark in their eyes and they immediately uh, go after it. And uh, when you talk about uh, problems and challenges, what is bigger than uh, climate change and the need to find uh, technolo technological solutions for the various challenges that uh, climate uh, change is uh, posing to humanity. And this is why we see so many uh, amazing entrepreneurs taking on, upon themselves uh, incredible challenges in order to bring this uh, innovation to the world. And uh, already today, we have uh, locally about 800, uh, just below 800 uh, tech companies. And as you can see, they are uh, quite diverse, uh, addressing different sectors of uh, climate, uh, either with mitigation or adaptation uh, in the various aspects of uh, human lives. Uh, you will hear a lot about it uh, later on in this event uh, from uh, the report. As I said before, uh, even in wartime, uh, people continue to work. It's not like uh, we have ceased operations and uh, wait for the war to end. Uh, I can tell you that since uh, October 7th, uh, I spoke and my team spoke with uh, probably hundreds of uh, entrepreneurs, CEOs, investors, all of them, uh, you know, keep one eye on the war, but the the second one is completely on their business. They understand that uh, they need to deliver and uh, global co uh, customers, global investors, uh, global partners, even though they stand uh, with Israel and uh, empathize, empathize with Israel, they still expect the companies to deliver. And uh, again, from all this uh, conversation, I can tell you that they deliver. They find a very creative uh, ways how to overcome the challenges the war, the war is posing, and uh, they deliver. Uh, on top of that, one of the things uh, that we discovered is that uh, because of uh, the uncertainty the war uh, created, uh, many uh, early stage uh, companies uh, got uh, a, surprised or were in the midst of a fundraising round 
Uh, and therefore, uh, we launched uh, just a few weeks ago uh, an, a, a bridge a bridge financing fund uh, sized at uh, one hundred million dollars for early stage uh, startups uh, with a short uh, runway of less than six months. So we can fund them uh, and let them pass through the times of war and then go back to the fund uh, raising with uh, no pressure. So from all aspects, uh, Israeli tech and Israeli climate tech uh, continues to deliver. And as I said before, we as the government agency responsible for the high tech sector, we are determined to do what, whatever is needed to make sure that uh, no asset of the Israeli tech is lost during the war and more so uh, to get out of this war even stronger than before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dror. It was really interesting to see how the the government supporting the climate tech ecosystem in Israel, and of course, like we uh, doing that uh, together. Uh, so thanks again for a great coll collaboration in general, and also for this new report. Uh, we will jump to our next uh, speaker, uh, Shani Zonesco, climate tech investor and co-founder and chair at Planet Tech. Shani, stage is yours. Thank you, and thank you, Dror, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, my name is Shani Zanesco, and it's great um, to see many familiar names and also new ones from all around the world. Uh, just a quick thank you to Planetech team uh, and also the Israel Innovation Authority for this partnership, but we've done so many partnerships from the first day of Planetech, so uh, thank you for that as well. Um, you know, we're used to talking about the word uh, resiliency, um, in context to climate and climate tech, it's a part of our day-to-day -day war that we're using. Um, and over the past 60 days, uh, resiliency, the word, uh, has received so many new meanings and layers and depth and breadth. Uh, and when we established Planet Tech, uh, it was 2020, um, which is a nonprofit joint venture of Consensus Business Group, which is a financial investor, UK-based group uh, led by Vincent Chengiz and the Israel Innovation Institute, a nonprofit building and driving innovation ecosystems. Um, we did so for many reasons, but you know, mainly from a deep belief in the Israeli high tech industry that they can tackle this uh, type of crisis, uh, one of the largest crises that uh, humanity has ever faced, uh, and leads a transition uh, of the global economy with technologies um, and also realizing the huge financial opportunities, which we'll dive in uh, just a bit. Um, so we did so from a deep belief, and I think that now uh, we no longer need to assume or believe uh, it's not a bet. It's it's in this uncertain times. It's probably the most certain thing that um, we know is that we can trust with the Israeli tech um, uh, industry and also the Israeli climate tech uh, uh, industry um, to to. To continue to be resilient and compassionate about everything that we do and resiliency and compassion compassion are two traits that are also so essential for driving innovation and finding solutions to tackle climate change um so i believe nothing is a coincidence and this is a reality and like draws has mentioned so many times and all of you are probably experiencing we are delivering no matter what and also exceeding that so we covered why israel Okay, uh, now I just want to dive into uh, why climate tech and also um, why um, uh, why planet tech and how, how we came about that. So quickly going to share my screen. Uh, so I've mentioned um, the people and the talent, but we also know, I'm just zooming out a little bit, that climate tech is not only one of the biggest crises. Um, of our, of our lifetime, but also a great opportunity. Bank of America priced it at a hundred and trillion dollar. Uh, and we have very, very massive tectonic shifts that have been happening in the world. Uh, not really, it's not from now, you know, we only talk about it now, but like, no, um, since, uh, the Paris Agreement and the race to zero, more and more Fortune 500, 100 uh, municipalities, countries are committing to decarbonize themselves and be uh, net zero. It's not just a slogan. Um, and we see the follow up of governments and uh, regulations that are taking into place and corporates, they have to report in a certain way. 
And as a result, we see loads of funding going to this uh, space like the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act in the US, $300 billion uh, we're talking about, you know, not small money, as well as the EU Green Deal, which many Israeli companies have also harnessed, as we know it. Um, and also our sorts of frameworks for fines and taxes and carbon offsetting and all this good stuff. The bottom line that I want to stress is everyone is realizing that climate risk is financial risk and what can be more perfect than uh, implementing climate technologies in their organizations in order to mitigate that risk, right? So we are talking big money. We are talking uh, big risks that we need to solve. We also have a generational shift, which I will not touch a lot because we don't have time. And also uh, a change in urgency, obviously, that impacts uh, everything that we do. Uh, we do see climate tech growing as an asset class from an investor perspective. Again, this is not just like slogans, we see the money, we see it. Um, currently, there are $121 billion of um, assets under management across all type of um, uh, funds. And currently we know as of September, $33 billion of investable dry powder, which is quite good. We also just see um, uh, the changes in uh, the stage and and you know the various uh, climate VCs. This is a better slide to show it. We have examples for climate tech companies and also big, um, big uh, funds that actually some of them, if maybe not all of them, actually have invested in Israeli climate tech companies. Um, this I will leave to our amazing experts to touch upon. But the first thing that we did in Planet Tech uh, is to define what it means when we talk about climate. Uh, tech and we we're happy that uh, entities like the Israel Innovation Authority and the EU have also adopted that and this is how we're going to share the findings of the report. Um, so this is as a homage for uh, last COP, uh, COP27. This is actually was another uh, Israel Innovation Authority Planet Tech collab. Uh, we took the first ever Israel uh, climate tech delegation uh, to present at COP. Um, and this is just a nice transition for me to, to tell you about uh, Planet Tech. So we are the innovation community for climate tech technology. We want to shift the Israeli climate, uh, tech industry into climate, but also create a global network, which we have. I'll, I'll share with you some of our partners. Um, sorry, double slide. And we do so by centralizing the ecosystem. So especially in climate, it is so I don't want to say important, it is essential. We cannot tackle climate change without centralizing the ecosystem and collaborating between stakeholders. It is not possible. And this is why everything that we do also in Planetech involves academia, other NGOs, corporates, government entities, other investors. And obviously, we are actually really doing all of that for the startups. So some of what we're doing here, a lot of you have attended it and we're happy about it. Uh, this I will also leave to our um, experts later. We are doing many, many collaborations with various partners from uh, uh, which are uh, different stakeholders, like I've mentioned before. Um, and in our line of work in sharing knowledge, we're doing things like building climate ecosystem in various countries. And you can check out the different reports that we did on our website. I'll share all the links later. Uh, we're also helping startups quantify what is their climate impact. Maybe it is larger than you know, and maybe it's a great way to receive more capital and, and acquire more customers and uh, business opportunity. Something that we did in the past uh, year or more is the Planet Tech Investors Alliance, over 40 VCs and investors um, gathering together, learning and sharing insights about deal flow and startups and how we can better invest in climate tech, which is nothing like any other sector. And it is the best sector to invest in. Um, uh, I think so. And also, of course, the Planet Tech Academy, which is already online and you can um, check a lot of courses that we did there, like a carbon market course and uh, nature based solutions competition uh, that we did recently. Uh, also, we ramped up our startup platform recently uh, and you can find yourself there if you're a startup, if not contact the great team. Uh, as I've mentioned, we're doing challenge comp competition. And as Dro mentioned, we were supposed to meet here in Israel in Tel Aviv in October uh, 18th face to face. Uh, we had to obviously postpone it, but no worries. We will, God's willing, uh, meet soon face to face and 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 celebrate also um, uh, prevailing all the challenges that we have now. 
um, some upcoming things that we have our office hours and other webinars. Uh, and we're here for you, for founders, for investors, uh, for anyone who wants to get involved, even if you don't have a company yet, you know, it's probably one of the best times to build a climate tech company. And we're here to help you. You have uh, so many resources with us, with the Israeli Innovation Authority. And this is Obviously, we have to end every conversation with a QR code, which you can see all the links, get involved. And last thing that I forgot to mention is we also launched a job board. So a lot of people are looking for jobs. A lot of people are looking for meaning right now. We have amazing startup companies that you can start working with. So it's all on here. And thank you very much. And I'm handing it uh, back over to you, Dad. Thank you very much, Shani. It was really uh, amazing to see how uh, Planet Tech and the Israel Innovation Authority doing like so much in the last couple of years to develop the, the climate tech ecosystem. And I think the report and the findings of the report are a great example for that. Uh, so we'll jump towards to, to, the, to the content of the event. So I'm really happy to um, invite our amazing two speakers, uh, Dr. Tamar Moiz, Scientific Director and, and Head of Climate programs at Planet Tech, and Dr. Hagit Schwemer, Senior Director in Climate and Health in Israel, in Israel Innovation Authority. And I will take the time to, to say thank you very much for both of you uh, for leading this amazing, amazing project. Uh, so Tamar, uh, the stage is yours. So, hi everybody. Uh, thank you, Dro. Thank you, Shani. Uh, thank you, Gal. And obviously, thank you to all our participants who are with us. Uh, so, first of all, I'd just like to say that I'm really happy to be here at this event. Um, I'm privileged to be part of the Israeli climate tech ecosystem and uh, privileged to have participated in the writing of uh, the reports uh, from 2021, 2022, and this current report. Um, so we know that the, uh, the timing of this report, it's, it's being brought out together with, uh, at the same time as uh, COP28. Um, so I just wanted to connect a little bit between sort of the COP events and climate innovation. And I stumbled across this description of, uh, that was given to what is COP, uh, which I think is really spot on. Um, and the description is that it's climate negotiations wrapped inside a conference inside a trade fair, because there really is so much going on at COP28. Obviously, it originated as Conference of the Parties to the UNFCCC, uh, the Convention on Climate Change. It's a meeting of world leaders, um, parties getting together to negotiate the frameworks uh, for international collaboration, cooperation to limit emissions and global warming. Um, but it's evolved into a mega event. Um, Diverse stakeholders come from governments to industry, sectoral experts, investors, as you see here, civil society. Um, I think 70,000 people are now in Dubai. And it's all together, as we said, as Shani mentioned before, together, varied and diverse stakeholders have to contribute and collaborate together. And this they do on the climate agenda and importantly on climate action. And in the last few years at COP, the private sector has really been racing ahead, championing, financing and innovation. So private sector are demonstrating uh, climate technologies, entrepreneurship, innovative approaches. This is sort of the trade fair and the exchange that is going on at COP. And specifically this year, the UAE have actually focused in on technology and innovation. It's one of the four cross-cutting themes which they focus on across each and every thematic day. And that's with the realization, obviously, that to support delivery on action, to develop, to deploy climate technologies, uh, it's central to the transition that is necessary. So this is in general about innovation, which we know is necessary, climate tech innovation. And Israel is now renowned already as an emerging climate tech ecosystem. And since 2021, Planet Tech and the Israel Innovation Authority have collaborated on collating information and providing the most up-to-date depiction of the Israeli climate tech ecosystem and how it's evolving 
over time. So we have a 2021 report, a 2022 update, and now the 2023 report, which is launched. It can be found on both our websites. It can be found on the website of the Israel Innovation Authority, and obviously I'm also on Planet Tech's website together with previous reports. So we urge you all, uh, not just to listen into this webinar, but to go download and to read in full the report. So what do we have in the report? What are we portraying in the ecosystem report? We're looking at the mapping of startups and growth companies who innovate and target climate change. The type of information we have within and that we'll be presenting here are the number of startups, what climate challenges they address and which ones are not addressed, the investment amounts, who's funding, towards which challenges, looking at trends, barriers, government support. And for the first time in this year in the 2023 report, we also map the geographic markets of the startups. And the report is really used very, very broadly by groups of Israeli and global stakeholders to gain insights on the opportunities that abound in Israel. So it's used by startups, it's used by sector specific communities, VCs, CVC, sorry, corporates themselves and governments. Uh, we actually receive numerous country delegations every year wanting to deep dive into the ecosystem. And they all use the report as a gateway, all these stakeholders for deeper exploration. Um, the basis of the report, um, the way we map the startups is according to the Planet Tech Challenge map, which uh, Shani sort of showed uh, briefly before. I'm also only going to relate to it very briefly. It can be seen in more depth on the Planet Tech website. The challenge map is a taxonomy that depicts the climate challenges of our economy, of our everyday life, for which technologies can provide solutions. And we classify 22 climate challenges across five challenge areas. This is the built environment, land use, materials and manufacturing, nature, and digital. So we have um, a challenge obviously around clean energy systems and sustainable mobility, uh, smart agriculture, climate smart agriculture, soil health. The list, as we say, it's 22 across these domains, novel low carbon materials. Um, all domains in which we're challenged to find climate positive technologies. Uh, the map also includes challenges to conserve and revive nature and biodiversity. And this we're understanding that the ecological crisis is tightly linked also to the climate crisis. Um, and again, they encompass mitigation, greenhouse gas removal, sequestration, and adaptation both of infrastructure, communities, and natural ecosystems. So we're not looking at technologies, we're looking at challenges and startups will have diverse solutions based on different technologies that can answer one of these climate challenges. So this is the basis for our mapping. Um, and let's go ahead and let's have a look at the report findings. So we're going to begin with the sort of the numbers and some of the climate challenges addressed. So we've had a little bit of a spoiler and we know now that in our 2023 report, we mapped out 784 Israeli climate tech startups. So just for formalizing, what is a startup? We define it as uh, less than 20 years old who have received investments or younger if you're uh, less than seven years uh, old than those who have yet to raise funding within this group of uh, younger startups. And what makes you a climate tech startup? If you can respond, if you have a solution, a tech that responds to one of those 22 challenges for mitigation or adaptation that we have showed on the Planet Tech Challenge Map, this sets you apart as a climate tech startup. And the innovation can be core to the business or it can be one branch of the business. And something to point out is that many startups obviously can provide a solution to one or more challenges. It may also be a novel material that can be used for clean energy. It may be a novel material, which is to do with circularity. Um, and mapping, and as we show the mapping, relates to the main challenge of a startup. So we see that this year we mapped out, and it's inclusive up to H1 of the report year of 2023, 784 climate tech startups. And if we're looking at our previous reports that came out in 2021, 2022, we actually see that we have a net growth of 150 climate tech companies. So we have a really growing ecosystem. And obviously each year we update the database with new companies. We take out those companies that have closed. And we also have companies that we may have overlooked or, or were not yet sort of 
are on the radar because they were in stealth mode. So we have a growing ecosystem with a net growth over the period of time that we've been mapping out the ecosystem. Um, what do they address? What solutions are provided by these startups? So here we see the 22 challenges and we see the number of startups that are addressing each of these challenges. And we see that the four leading challenges are climate smart agriculture and clean energy systems, both of these having around 136, seven startups, followed by sustainable mobility and then alternative proteins. So these are the four leading startups as far as, sorry, leading challenges as far as the number of startups. And we can carry on reading down and I just urge you to go to the reports and look and actually sort of uh, uh, follow. We have sort of eco-efficient water, circularity, novel materials, food loss and waste. Uh, something to point out is, is those challenge areas which actually have few startups. And we see that towards the bottom of this challenges within the nature challenge area together with mineral uh, and metal mining only have a low number of startups. So here we're looking at the picture of all the Israeli startups. If we have a similar graph or a similar uh, diagram, and we're only going to look at more uh, at, at newer startups, those startups have been established since 2018. So we're talking about around five and a half years. Uh, by the way, this makes up nearly 50% of all startups. So we see that we have a young ecosystem. 50% of startups are, are uh, less than five and a half years old. And we see here a change in the ranking. So the top two challenge areas are the same energy systems and climate smart agriculture. We see that alternative proteins has taken over from sustainable mobility. But again, these are still the main four uh, challenge areas. What we see here is also we have a change in the ranking when we're looking at uh, young startups. Carbon capture and utilization together with carbon management platforms have actually leaped up a big step uh, by five rankings, showing that these are predominantly young startups. In fact, I think for these two uh, sectors, they're nearly all <laughs> uh, young startups. And on the other hand, we can see that some of our other challenge areas, uh, eco-efficient water infrastructure and low carbon buildings, that's everything to do with the operational emissions, cooling and heating, insulation, etc. in a building. We actually have less new startups since 2028, so the 2018, sorry, uh, showing that these uh, challenge areas and the startups within are more mature and established. So we have here our eight leading challenge areas if we're looking collectively at the last five plus years. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this next graph. Again, you can go to the report and you can look at it more. What I just wanted to point out is that these same eight challenge areas, also on an annual basis, consistently, they have the largest number and the highest number of new startups. Uh, so what we're, and they make up between, you know, we can look at the different percentages here, between 65 and 80% uh, of all newly established startups. So we see we have a large volume of the startups in the leading challenge areas. Um, and we see that Israel has a specialization and expertise in, in the challenge areas that are depicted within. Um, we'll take a glimpse now into the two leading challenge areas as far as the number of startups in general and new startups clean energy systems and climate smart agriculture. And then we'll actually have presentations from uh, a startup from each of these challenge areas. Um, so first of all, I just give a little glimpse into the diversity of solutions that are provided by Israeli startups within clean energy. We actually have three sub challenges within. So we're talking about innovations which relate to energy in context of clean generation, efficient transmission, smart distribution, and storage at different scales. And when we map out the startups, we see that the bulk of the startups are associated with generation. It's from solar, wind, waste, even waves we have, and production of hydrogen through various pathways, including electrolysis, uh, use of photocatalyzers, waste, and others, uh, as well as ammonia as an energy carrier. Uh, let me just put in the background, this is uh, the Planetech startup platform where you can see um, the various startups within some of the startups within the clean energy uh, system challenge area. So we spoke about the bulk being in generation, 
Uh, storage is offered by startups with various solutions, improved and novel batteries, compressed air, thermal storage, both, both heat <laughs> and also ice, uh, and flywheels, and hydrogen that we mentioned in context of generation. We also have startups uh, providing solutions for storage and, and transporting hydrogen more efficiently and cost effectively. When we actually map out the newer startups, we see that many of the newer energy startups are affiliated with solar. And many focus on optimization of installation locations and maintenance service, as well as SaaS and AI systems for optimization in general of energy networks and the grid. So that's a sort of a, a little, uh, really quick review of what type of startups we have within uh, clean energy um, systems. Um, we can do a similar review in climate smart agriculture, uh, again, the leading challenge. Here we have five sub challenges covering everything that's required to ensure food security whilst we're still mitigating uh, agricultural land footprint and emissions. And of course, adapting agricultural systems to the impact of climate change. So startups reducing land footprint are those that are basically improving crop yields. Um, Again, it can be from an array of tech. It could be precision agriculture through images and sensors. Enhanced photosynthesis. We have startups looking, doing so by disease detection through robotics and automation. Um, the need for less land by increasing nutritional content of the crop, as well as various novel farming systems. Reduced inputs will relate to startups who uh, reduce fertilizers, Obviously, with their immense footprint, again, it could be through precision agriculture, through biologicals for protection, or also as biostimulants. Uh, there are a large number of startups targeting more prudent use of water, and we see them also monitoring these both through the crops and trees themselves, as well as soil moisture. Um, less emissions, whether it's from machinery, livestock, whether we have a couple of startups targeting uh, enteric methane emissions from livestock, and resilience ensuring the robustness of crops to changing environmental conditions, such as heat, precipitation patterns, drought, salinity, and changing seasons. So this is sort of a very quick review on some of the startups we have uh, within these two main challenges. And my sharing seems to have crashed. I'm going to just take a minute to try and uh... I suggest in the meantime um, while well, I'm trying to get my presentation back I'm not sure what you can see on your screen but my computer seems to have crashed somehow with the presentation um, I would like to invite perhaps to take the opportunity, we spoke about a lot of uh, the startups dealing uh, um, with solar, we know that at COP28 at the moment, um, there are commitments talking about tripling uh, renewables, doubling energy efficiency, again that's relating mostly to solar and wind. Um, I'd actually like to invite and, and uh, to discuss and present an Israeli startup with a completely different type of energy source. And that would be a NT Tau, looking at compact fusion energy. And I'd like to invite our first speaker, Oded Gour Lavi, the CEO and co-founder of NT Tau, to share with us their developments in compact fusion energy. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. Happy to present uh, NT Tau. Uh, I, the uh, compact fusion system, I'm the co-founder and CEO of, of Tau, and would be happy to uh, explain what we're trying to do. Uh, basically, uh, when we look at the problem, uh, the problem is that we're doomed. In a sense, if we continue to use the current energy sources, uh, then we will be hit with a very strong climate crisis. We're already in it. Uh, the energy security will be uh, uh, less and less. And with an increasing energy demand, which is an exponential growth of demand of energy, uh, we will see a, a stronger and stronger crisis. While when we look at the political will or maybe ability to actually make a dent on everything, 
and to try and solve the uh, the problem we do not uh, see a strong political will or capability so basically uh, we're doomed but uh, the solution exists and it's usually in technology that's why we're here in planet tech and we're talking technology and climate tech uh, and in the best technology that nature gave us is fusion energy uh, and in that case is taking small atoms uh, hydrogen here tritium in this case the heavy ions of, of hydrogen giving them enough energy they will fuse give helium helium and then a lot of energy enormous amounts of energy come out of that and that's a, an exponential solution and the number speaks for the, it's at themselves so if we look at fusion power the fusion energy capability if you look at uh, chemical energy coal oil uh, if you take a kilo of those you'll get 30 to 50 megajoules of energy from those uh, from coal or oil but if you go to fusion energy which is nuclear energy you get 350 million megajoules that's seven orders of magnitude more energy and that's an exponential solution for an exponential problem that we're faced with in order to really solve uh, the enormous amounts of energy needed and what we see in the last uh, decade i would just say is some converging trends and specifically more in the last five years is converging trends uh, enabling this uh, enabling technologies first uh, some of them are high power computers that enable very strong very uh, good simulations mind you no simulation could really give you a full answer but simulation enable uh, to go faster and then power electronics strong power electronics that exist today that haven't haven't existed in in past decades that can really enable control over the energy that is needed in order to heat plasma to create the energy and high field, high temperature superconductors that enable stronger magnets, more flexible design possibilities for those magnets, which are needed to hold high temperature plasma in place in order to create the fusion and reactions to happen. And when we look at those converging trends, we see, you know, the private capital. Tamal was talking to a lot of, uh, and, and, and Dr. Bin was talking about uh, the capital going into climate tech, only to fusion we see in the last uh, basically five to 10 years, over $6 billion have gone through the private sector, pushing forward, enabling after decades of research, many, many decades, we're standing on shoulders of 80 years of experimental uh, knowledge, uh, and we're pushing forward with faster pace because of private sector going in. And all of these, and with regulatory framework and, and the timelines that are needed, I think we're, we can achieve a, a grand vision, a vision of a future with clean, affordable, reliable energy, secure the, and universally accessible, really to empower all humans everywhere and to um, try to restore back uh, some of the harmony necessary between uh, humanity and nature uh, to really keep us uh, moving forward. And uh, with what we have uh, found in our technology of optimal plasma regime, uh, we have found a way to create, uh, I would say, a very strong power, very strong uh, uh, power box of uh, container size that can actually push and light up a small city uh, with very quick deployment, avoiding some of the greed efficiencies, anti tau's future market capabilities with a 10 to 20 megawatt power box like this that can enable about 10,000 homes. And you can see the rest of the uh, other uh, markets that are capable of data center, industrial facilities. Each and every one of those can get one container can give so much energy to faraway islands, off-grid uh, uh, areas or disaster areas. We have very strong collaborations. We believe in, in collaboration that can enable us to really uh, solve this. Among our investors, uh, you can see they're from the US, Europe, Japan area and Israel. So we're very happy to have uh, all those uh, strong uh, forces working with us. And in conclusion, I would say that uh, I think it's going to happen this decade. I hope it's going to be anti-Tau. And I think part of it is because of our small system, faster, uh, larger markets, faster in the development, cheaper in the development and, and deployment. I think this can really change the path of climate. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Odette, for presenting us uh, on the tech, which is really disruptive of NT Tau. And I'm not sure whether I introduced you correctly at the time, so uh, because of my Zoom crashing. So uh, for those that, uh, if, in case I didn't, so Odette is the CEO and co-founder of NT Tau. So thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to uh, introduce onwards uh, Omer Davidi, CEO and co-founder of BeHero who will discuss to us about precise pollination and also protection of those pollinators uh, as an example of a climate smart agriculture uh, startup. So the floor is yours, Omar. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Tamar. And uh, thanks everyone for setting this up. I think it's uh, great to have everyone together, if not physically, uh, at least virtually. Uh, so I'm Omar, as you mentioned, I'm the CEO and uh, one of the co-founders of, of Bee Hero. Uh, at Bee Hero, uh, we focus on saving the bees and I think before we dive a little bit more into what we do, uh, just to provide maybe more context that food production is going to be one of the major challenges for us, uh, as well as energy, as Odette showed before. Uh, and in the next 50 years, we'll need to produce more food than what we have produced over the last uh, uh, 10,000 years combined. So that's a huge challenge. And this is not a challenge for one company or one entity to try and deal with. We all need to work together in order to address this issue and make sure that we support the growing population. Another interesting fact when it comes to food production is that the majority of food production depends on those tiny little insects uh, for pollination. So we have three mechanisms in nature for crops to, to for plants to pollinate, uh, which is wind, gravity, which is considered to be self-pollinated, and then insect pollination, which is the major segment. And as some of you probably know, those bees that we uh, depend on them so much are in trouble and they're dying. And today we see more than 40% of bee colonies collapse every single year. And we have beekeepers out there working extremely hard in order to revive those hives and maintain some sort of a steady population of bees uh, to support, support food production. But food production needs to be increased and we need to ensure that we can build a sustainable model that, that support those efforts. Um, what we've done in Bee Hero, we developed low cost sensors that goes into an existing beehive. I think some of the challenges as we are dealing with more of old fashioned industries is that we need to change things in a way that people can digest and happy to adopt. And we've managed to deploy those sensors in hundreds of thousand hives across the globe. And we focus on two areas. We collect things like temperature, humidity, sound, and so on from inside those hives. We collect environmental information like crop type, varieties, densities, and so on. And then we uh, basically early detect and predict things that cause those colony to get weak and collapse. Things like queen failure, starvation situation, mite pro mites problem, and so on. And we work constantly with the beekeepers to ensure that they can support healthy uh, bees and efficient bees. And when those bees are loaded onto trucks to move between crops during the year and provide pollination services, we can do it in a more precise way. And a few years ago, Be Hero founded and, and introduced the concept of precision pollination as a service. And in less than uh, four years, we became the largest pollination provider in the US as well as in Australia with tens of millions of dollars in revenues. And ideal, we're going to add another digit soon. So we are working extremely hard, uh, probably one of the fastest growing active companies out there. A uh, great team doing a lot of great stuff and, and introducing this new concept of pollination, uh, which we have a lot more work to do. Um, one of the interesting areas that we discover as we created this data set of bees on pollination that didn't exist, definitely not in this scale in the past, is it opens huge opportunities for uh, future revenue streams and bee here are already introduced concepts in the insurance play with commercial beekeepers, in-field sensing to support also biodiversity aspects, uh, and support food production in a more sustainable way, all the way up to working with private equity and commodity traders to address bees and pollination data in their models. So in, in a way, we just learned today some of the opportunities that we will work on in the next few years. And it's very exciting you know, to be one of those leading Israeli companies pushing this thing uh, forward. Uh, we founded the company in Israel by the end of 2017. Um, and today we operate in three main areas. We have the R&D center in Israel, we have the business unit sitting in the US, and we just expanded to the Australian market. So time zone is a big thing for us. Uh, we brought some of the top strategic investors to support Bureau efforts like General Mills, Rubble Bank, 
and so on. Uh, and putting a lot of emphasis on on ESG, uh, it's 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 about you know building a profitable and and sustainable company, but also ensuring that we are building a more sustainable food system that can exist for years to come, and not just address the the, the food needs of of our uh, uh, current times. And I think that's part of the reason that we've managed to bring so much talent, uh, especially from Israel, but across the globe, to support Bureau efforts uh, moving forward. Thank you so much, and thank you for the recognition and some of the great activity that we have out there, and we look forward to collaborate with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omel. Again, amazing to see the, the quick and fast growth and how you've penetrated the markets. Um, I'll just go back to some findings of the report and um, we're looking here at a graph that those of you who have read our previous reports may be familiar with the format. We're looking at the growth map of the climate tech uh, challenge areas, challenges. Uh, we're basically seeing three types of information. On the y-axis we're seeing that the challenges are mapped according to their fraction or the percentage of young companies. Those are companies that have been established in the last three and a half years out of the full a total number of um, uh, startups within that challenge. Um, the circles that we're seeing are the total number of startups in that challenge and what we're seeing on the x-axis is basically the investments. So I'll try and run through this really quickly and just point out some of the, the main findings. We see we have clusters and groupings of, of challenges and again I think we're probably familiar with this now that we have our established fields of climate smart agriculture, energy and mobility. Uh, we have large number of startups sorry for that. We have a large number of startups, they've received uh, high investments over time and here we see like moderate growth. Of course, it's moderate growth on the base of the fact that they have a large number of startups because we've seen that they are indeed growing. Uh, rapid growth. We see here our alternative proteins, which has a small number of startups, but has received quite a lot of investment, even comparable to the climate smart agriculture, and relatively a large fraction of young and newer startups. And this fits in with what we've seen earlier. We will point out that last year we also had within rapid growth, we had green construction, um, everything to do with embodied emissions within uh, the construction industry. Um, and at least as far as what we've identified, we did not identify any new companies in the last three and a half years, which means that green construction has gone down to what we call the cluster of stagnated growth. Companies that relatively have got small number of uh, startups but have received more than the median of investments but there's definitely room to grow here what sticks out very clearly is what we call the new arrivals we have here two challenges the carbon management and carbon capture and utilization so we have a smaller number of startups with still relatively low investments but a really huge fraction around 80 percent of new companies and we see that the software-based carbon management, actually we have more companies than the hardware-based carbon capture and utilization. And the main cluster here is early growth um, startups, uh, which are, uh, again, some of them are within what we call the eight leading challenges, whether it's the circularity in the food loss and waste. And those that are emerging, still substantial new startups between 30 to 50% are still young. The investments are growing and we expect as we go into the future to see more growth of these challenges which are sort of the less traditional climate tech uh, than the climate smart agriculture and the energy systems. Uh, so what we'd like to do is actually uh, also have a glimpse into uh, two challenges from two different clusters. Uh, from new arrivals we'll take a look into carbon capture and utilization and for stagnated growth we'll look into green construction. Um, 
Carbon capture and utilization within Israel, we have 14 startups and they really cover land and ocean removal, a biomass burial, we have ocean chemistry loops, land-based, nature-based solutions, obviously direct air capture, point source capture, as well as utilization uh, to syngas and carbonate minerals. And we have startups that are targeting not only carbon removal, but also looking at other greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide. Today, there are various topics which I won't go into at carbon removal that are being discussed at COP28. One of them also being ocean innovation, and we'll be hearing shortly from Carbon Blue about their carbon removal process in oceans and how it, they will scale carbon removal. And the second uh, challenge area that we wanted to point out and bring a startup uh, to present to you actually relates to today's thematic program at COP28, which is on urbanization and built environment. Uh, we know that embodied emissions from construction account for more than 16% of global emissions, and we need to go beyond the low carbon cement and concrete. And this is what Israeli startups are doing. We have startups that are dedicated to alternative building materials, to eliminating the footprint of cement. Those that target building design, cement curing, so this reduces the amount of materials, as well as various management platforms that reduce material waste and support the choices of what type of materials with what type of footprint we'll be using, as well as those that are looking at the targeting construction waste and creating circular building components. So here we will hear from StructurePal and they will talk to us about their uh, designing with AI in order to uh, reduce concrete amounts. So I'm very happy again to invite our third speaker, Dan Deviri, co-founder and CEO of Ocean Blue, of Carbon Blue, sorry, to share with us the developments in ocean CO2 removal. Thank you, Tamar. I'm uh, very happy to be here. And uh, uh, as Tamar said, we are developing, we're a startup company in the field of, uh, of carbon dioxide removal, meaning capturing carbon dioxide from the environment after it was emitted. Uh, so just to frame what is the problem and why it is so important, here you see a graph that I'm sure that many of you have seen many times about, uh, which for me encompasses the essence of what is climate tech, uh, which is dealing with the challenge of, uh, of reducing the levels of, uh, of greenhouse gases emissions uh, in the atmosphere to a level that mitigate climate change. And to do that, uh, we have to do that for all of the greenhouse gases. And here we see the major one, which is carbon dioxide, and uh, the pro projected growth of the emissions over time. As you can see here, uh, first and foremost, we have to reduce emissions as much as possible, which means adopting uh, renewable energy, uh, um, energy efficient technologies, electrification, and many, many types of innovations that uh, we've seen uh, today and, and all across the ecosystem. But this is not enough because removing carbon dioxide completely getting it to zero is impossible. And the residual emissions will need to be accounted for by capturing the emissions after, uh, after it is released to the atmosphere. And this is the essence of carbon dioxide removal. And we need to get, according to the IPCC, to about 10 billion tons a year, which is like the annual uh, production of steel, cement, and oil. Meaning few years, we need to get carbon dioxide removal to be one of the largest industries. And we developed in Carbon Blue a technology that we believe can do that. And we do that by not by um, constructing standalone facilities dedicated to carbon capture, uh, to carbon removal, sorry, because that takes long time and is very slow and expensive. What we aim to do is to use existing infrastructure to take different industries and make those industries on top of what the, the, the function of the industry is to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we do that by targeting water because water infrastructure uh, is very prevalent in different industries. And if we would have removed the, the carbon dioxide from the water just by applying a technology in those industries that we see and in many, many others, we can get to the gigaton, we can easily get to gigaton scale removal. 
And to do that, we have developed a technology, a proprietary chemical process to remove the carbon dioxide. I will not get into the technical details, but basically what it does, it is a circular process that splits uh, aqueous solutions with carbon dioxide into a pure stream of carbon dioxide and decarbonated water, which is by itself something that helps the industry, which incentivizes the industry to collaborate with us and install our equipment at their site. And uh, what you see here is our pilot site integrated with a desalination facility in Israel. At the moment, it is a very small scale, but it allows us to uh, test and quantify the performance of our technology. And here you see uh, us in comparison to the current incumbent, which is Climbox, the direct air capture company, companies that uh, filter out the carbon dioxide directly from uh, from ambient air. And here you see another advantage, uh, uh, physical advantage of removing the carbon dioxide from water is that water holds much more carbon dioxide than in air, which uh, allows us to get better costs and uh, much smaller capex and land area compared to alternative technologies. Of course, after we remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, the, the, carbon, the water becomes decarbonated and reabsorbs over time due to th thermodynamics back uh, the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, what you see here is our pilot site. Now it is, it is still a prototype stage, but it is in development. And next year, hopefully, we will, uh, we will start to run a 400 tons facility, which uh, will be the largest ocean-based carbon removal uh, facility in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I'm happy now to invite Jonathan Lasovsky, founder and CEO at StructurePal. Um, the floor is yours, Jonathan, and we're excited to hear about your technology. Thank you. Okay, so hello, everybody. As Tamar mentioned, my name is Jonathan Lasovsky. I'm the CEO and founder of StructurePal. I'll start by stating a fact. The construction industry is using too much material, or to be more precise, more than it should. And that is due to the fact that we over-design all of our buildings in terms of material. StructurePal is here to try to eliminate that concept of over-design, beginning with concrete, which is obviously the worst material worldwide and in our industry as well. Next, please. Okay. Easy. Okay, so a few words about the industry and concrete. Our industry is one of the worst, without even a doubt, reaching almost 40% of global CO2 emissions in terms of real estate and construction as well. 10% of those 40% are just from the concrete industry. And if we we'll go more macro about concrete, one cubic meter of reinforced concrete, something that everyone can imagine, equals 500 kilos of CO2 emissions in its life cycle, which is a horrible number. Next, please. And if that's not enough, you know, you jumped too much. One back, please. And if that's not, not enough, a few more facts. 80% of the weight of the building is concrete and half of the embodied emissions lies in that material. And if we look about the economics of concrete, we see that a third of the cost of the project will go into it. And the number and the worst number that we're talking about, and you understood how expensive and how in terms of cost and emission concrete is. But the worst thing is that we over designed by roughly 30% in all of our buildings and there is even worse numbers to come. So horrible problem, what can we do about it? Next slide, please. First thing is to identify, identify the problem, where it starts. It starts with our engineers. They are in a horrible position and they are the ones to design our buildings. Why horrible position? First of all, we have more buildings that we have to build by the day while having less and less engineers in the profession. And if that's not enough, no design time available. Four weeks is just nothing for a building. And again, with this situation, our engineers will have to compromise by using all kinds of copy-paste tactics and thumb rules, uh, I'll say strategies, leading to that excess of 30% and above in concrete, 
which gets to attend almost 10% losses for the developer client. Next, please. So what can we do about it? We've developed a software solution that incorporates AI into the process. And by thus helping the engineers reduce an equilibrium of 50% in terms of volume, but at the same time of cost of the material, reaching to almost 30% in reduction in terms of CO2 emissions for the structure. And that happens without any learning curve. That means it integrates into their software and reduce roughly 50% of their work. Next slide, please. Now, how does it work? So our industry, to be honest, sees the dollar before it sees the carbon. And therefore, we have to produce an incredible return on investment for our clients. That means when we ask for $2 for a square meter and in return provide us 15%, we show an ROI that moves from 5 to 10%, $10 for each dollar invested. And that's something that brings the industry in, an industry that is very old and very static about innovation. Next, please. So simple workflow. We tell our engineers, instead of drafting, don't draft, specify the challenge. Tell the AI what is your, your, your parameters and constraints, such as materials, regulations, code, costs, architectural limitations, and so on, and let the AI run in the background, iterate by itself, different designs, eventually converging into that optimal design at the end. And not only that, providing the engineer with fully drafted 3D models, analytical models, quantity reports and calculation reports with a summary of CO2 emissions at the end. Next, please. Now, all this beauty and this system can, can provide a huge financial impact. That means we can earn up to $9 billion if all the world would use our software, but that's one number. Please see the number on the right bottom, which is 144 billion kilos of CO2 emissions that can be reduced from our industry on a yearly basis, and that's where we are aiming. But even if you're looking at the SAM, that's still a good number to get to 50 billion kilos. We will be okay with that as well. Next, please. We are targeting at the moment, large scale developers, which are clients from the simple reason that they're, they're producing more concrete and using more concrete and at the same time are more available for innovation. Next, please. We've been doing great. We are practically spread from Hong Kong, through Israel, through Europe, and through Canada with clients, design partners, and investors. We've been winning a few prizes from both ends. That means from the construction, from the contact air vertical, let's say, and from the climate tech vertical as well, going through the best programs available for that matter. Next, please. And the beauty itself is the team, I'll say. A group of frustrated engineers who decided to make that leap into tech, into software development, into AI, and help build this miracle that you see in front of you. A miracle, a software, an AI that helps reduce concrete in, a, in such a level that investors such as Shikunu Binu and Shafir, the largest construction companies in Israel groups, I'll say, decided to invest. And we have investors from uh, from all sides, from Hong Kong, from Israel, even from Australia and Canada. And we are very proud of what we're doing. So thank you very much for having me today. I'm Jonathan Lazovsky, and we are Structure Pal. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, for telling us about your, your tech, which is truly impactful within the industry. Um, Okay, we're going to go ahead and I'll just uh, show a few slides now, talk about how climate tech is racing ahead and opening on the uh, investments. Okay.
Yeah, I'm also having a problem with the presentation. Can you show, please? Well, it was good. You can continue. Yeah, okay, then I'm doing it again. It's okay. Now, would you like me to start with my slides meanwhile? All right, let me just have one more attempt, and then uh, if it doesn't work, then absolutely. Okay, sorry for that, everybody. So running through very quickly, just showing how the climate tech in Israel is racing ahead and to start talking a little bit about the investments. Um, just as a sort of statement, we should note that the relative fraction of Israeli climate tech startups is growing year by year. One out of every six new startups that are established, all of those that were established in 2022, are climate tech. You can read more about that in the report. A little bit just mentioning our investments. If we look at findings from last year's report, we see a massive growth from 2018 to 2021. This is uh, investments in climate tech, in startups, an increase of 340%. Last year, we didn't yet know what to say, what would be happening in 2022. We only had data from the first half. Going into 2022, we see that investments were more or less stable. 2022, we had $2.3 billion of investments. What's remarkable is this was a time when in Israel, at the time, investments in general tech was massively decreased. So basically, we're seeing that investment wise, the, the uh, Israeli climate tech was actually 400% more resilient than general high tech as far as the investments that came in. What are we seeing if we compare to global investments in climate tech? Here we have a graph which basically shows the investment trends compared to global investments. Here we have the global, here we have Israel. We're not looking at absolute amounts. We're looking at normalized, normalized to what was invested in 2018. So we see a growth also globally and also in Israel, but we see the growth in Israel is much larger. And that makes sense considering it's a much smaller ecosystem and has where to expand to. So we have a massive growth. And what we're seeing from 2021 and onwards is actually how Israel mirrors global trends as Israel climate tech has actually become more mainstream. So like global investments in 2022 were more or less stable and similar to 2021 and a big decrease, which we're seeing globally due to various uh, economic uh, issues around the world that for the first half at least of 2023, climate tech investments uh, uh, were decreased somewhat. The last slide I'm just gonna show here is just also you can see the differentiation of how these investments were split between the climate challenges. And basically what we see that those same four leading challenge areas, both for the all the new startups, are those that also received the highest annual funding. That's clean energy systems, mobility, climate smart agriculture, and alternative proteins. Um, at this stage, Thank you for bearing with me. Um, and I'm very happy to invite Dr. Hagit Schwimmer, who is Senior Director of Climate and Health at the Startup Division at Israel Innovation Authority, to continue sharing the findings of the report. Thank you, Tamar. It was a um, pleasure to collaborate. And I'll just Yes. So um, after Tamar described the investments in Israel, I'll move to the investors. And as you can see here, since 2018, Israel Climate Tech has attracted almost 540 investor groups, as well as large number of additional private investors. Many of, the, of these investor groups have invested multiple times. So um, these are groups and not invest um, investors and not investments. So um, averaging um, 2.7 investments per investor. As you can see here, 
of the investors are Israeli and 48%, almost half of them, are non-Israeli, predominantly from the USA. Over 50% of the funding derives from venture capital funds. You can see here, when we um, divide the Israeli and the non-Israeli, you can see that these are quite evenly distributed between them. Um, however, corporate VCs investments originate nearly entirely from the non-Israel um, entities. Also, most of the private investors not shown in these charts also originate from outside of Israel. I move into the government funding um, of climate tech. Um, we have several goals in this uh, government funding. Um, the support comes from several ministries and entities. The goal is de-risking the investments, encouraging the private sector, targeting focal areas, and also the collaboration of government, several government ministries and entities can leverage the budget and create synergy of shared and different goals. So the, innovation, the Israel Innovation Authority has a unique position here, Dror described it in the beginning, as the one responsible for promoting innovative technologies or platforms addressing the dynamic and changing needs of the local and international innovation ecosystems. The authority, as you've heard before, has made climate tech one of the focus areas supporting and de-risking climate tech technology technological development and ecosystem growth. In 2022, you can see here the authority supported 273 climate tech ventures with a total budget of $71.4 million, which comprises 16% of its annual budget. This support was provided through all of the funding tools of the authority. Also, you, you've heard in the beginning, I'll be very quick here, um, you can see here the direct investments in companies, also three R&D consortia um, are supported, were established in the field of bioplastic, um, the Black Soldier Fly, Circularity, and Culture and Meat. Um, the, the, pilots, the pilots program, together with the Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Enver Environmental Protection, and the Ministry of Agriculture, also the government Companies Authority um, invested together $9 million in climate tech startups with ventures in the later phase, later phase R&D pilot testing and implementation. The advanced manufacturing, the authority provided support for climate tech companies in their scale up of R&D projects with the commercial manufacturing facilities and also the human capital. Um, the authority utilizes its human capital support tracks to increase capacity building in climate tech fields, to enhance entrepreneurship skills of climate tech experts, and to fill the gaps in capabilities for new and modified fields of expertise. Specific focus we have on the international activities. The authority has launched a program to promote collaboration in R&D and pilots of Israel startups and multinational corporates in climate-related fields. This program promotes the exposure of the Israeli innovation to global markets and global collaboration. Also, Israel participates in the Euro European Framework Program for R&D, Horizon Europe, which en enables startups, academic researchers, and other entities to collaborate in European projects to promote climate-related solutions. In 2022, the number of participants and the success rate in climate tech or green deal projects were significantly higher than pre previous years, um, mostly in clean energy, agriculture, food, and mobility, again, in accordance with the relatively high number of startups, as was shown earlier today by Tamal. Also, the, we have the incubators, the incubators and innovation labs. Um, the authority supported ideation and early state ventures by seven incubators and innovation labs, two of which were established in the last two years. And you can see here an example, five of them. Um, all of them focus in climate-related fields. For example, you can see here ESIL, um, the lab that with a field of top activity in clean tech, environment, and sustainability, 
net zero focus on energy, climate tech, um, and mobility and construction, I for Valley uh, focus in smart or and climate related industry, also in Negev and trend line. We know climate tech startups face unique scaling challenges. They're mostly deep tech requiring expensive physical assets and equipment um, and capital in intensive. So we, we wanted to learn more about the barriers and the difficulties um, from the startups. So we conducted, so in order to, to learn more about the difficulties and barriers, um, we've conducted a survey among the climate startups. We also wanted to learn more and to have more information on the global activity and the technology, technology implementation around the globe. 210 startups responded to the survey. The distribution across planet tech challenges areas was similar to the distribution among the full data set. Um, startups and companies from pre-seed through uh, uh, round C to round C, as well as public companies, 80% already have a product. And interestingly, um, nearly 80% of the startups operating within the country, meaning that 20% do not even target the local market. Israel is a small market. The three primary self-reported difficulties out of the 13 proposed in the survey were financing, um, scale up and followed by regulation, distance from target market pilot site and ongoing operational costs in dust order. Um, capability of scale, scale up, you might say, is complex and may include other barriers um, and responders could mark more than one. The Israeli market is the most prolific with nearly 80% of the startups operating within its borders, meaning that around 20% do not target the local market, as I said before. So the technologies are deployed in 132 countries. 40% of, of the startups are active in USA, but you can see the activity in all the, all the continents. The leading European markets are Germany, Italy, and, Sp and Spain, approx approximately with 23%. Canada has a similar re represent representation. The leading markets in Latin America are Mexico and Brazil. You can see India and South Africa with 15% in Asia and Africa and, sorry, and Australia also with 15% of the companies are active in Australia. So by that, um, this is all the information we present from the report. And I would like to present two more startups um, to uh, present themselves in the eco-efficient water infrastructure. We have Astera. And again, in agriculture, resilient food systems and climate action, we have Salico. So before we summarize, we talk a little bit about the future, about the results. We give you uh, the take home message. I would like to present uh, Jonathan Rabinovich from Astera, Global Marketing Manager. Please, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Planetech and to the IIA for having us here. Great. So I want to speak for the next few minutes about what Astera is and some of our use cases in the world of sustainability and climate change. Uh, so what Astera does on the most basic level is take a very specific type of satellite-based radar, specifically called L-band synthetic aperture radar, and run analyses on it to find different phenomenon within the ground. Uh, L-band is a technology that's existed since the 1950s. 
but it's been mostly relegated to academic and military purposes. And Astera is really the first company that's taken this very specific type of radar and made it applicable to a wide variety of verticals that help uh, humanity and help solve the climate crisis. Uh, just a little bit about the company before I discuss the technology and use cases. Um, it was founded in 2016 or went commercial in 2016. Uh, we're an Israel headquartered company. Most of our R&D is here, but we have offices in the USA, the UK, and Japan. Uh, to date, we're working in over 64 countries with over 800 projects. We're the largest commercial purchaser of Elba. I'm sorry to, to in interrupt. Can you please share your screen? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Can you see it now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, to, date, to date, we're the largest commercial uh, purchaser of L-band SAR data in the world, uh, 75 plus employees, and we hold 11 patents in uh, Pulsar. Uh, the first of the sustainability use cases that I want to talk about today is with our technology to locate leaks in in uh, underground water pipelines. Uh, we talk about the water crisis and we talk about the need to save water. And oftentimes that translates, for example, in Israel to campaigns encouraging people to you know turn off the sink when you brush your teeth and to take shorter showers, et cetera. But what many people don't realize is that much of the water that's lost is actually lost before it even gets to your home. In many countries, we're talking about upwards of 30% of the water taken from water resources is just lost into the ground before it reaches people's homes. Uh, so with our technology, we're able to actually see underneath the ground where these leaks are happening along the water pipeline and provide that data to water utilities. To date, Using that technology, we've saved, um, we've identified about 100,000 plus leaks around the world, uh, which amounts to savings on average of about 368 billion gallons of water. Um, water often doesn't just get to our home. Usually it has to be pumped there, and that pumping takes electricity. To give a sense of the numbers in Israel, about 20% of the electricity consumed in the country, of the energy consumed, is used just to pump water. So you can imagine that if you have a problem where water is just being leaked into the ground, then you're using electricity for really no reason. So if we're able to fix those uh, those leaks and identify where they are, by that, we're able to actually reduce carbon emissions and reduce the amount of energy being used. So to date, We've saved CO2 emissions equivalent to about 235,000 tons uh, since 2017. Uh, another way our technology is used is to actually create soil moisture maps. What's going on beneath the surface? Where is there water? And this is data that has relevancy to a lot of uh, engineering challenges that are happening around the world as a result of climate change or are being exacerbated by climate change. Uh, we estimate that about 75% of geotechnical failures that happen, for example, rail derailments and things like that are a result of drainage issues. So we work with rail companies and other infrastructure companies around the world to see where water is building up underground and to help solve these issues before they become uh, a disaster. Uh, water building up, of course, is a result of changing rain patterns and we're seeing this phenomenon more and more across the globe. Uh, it's the same thing in roads. This is actually a photo taken um, along a highway in Israel where a sinkhole opened up. Using the same technology of soil moisture mapping, we're able to determine in advance where a sinkhole might happen and prevent it before the sinkhole opens up. Again, phenomena that are be that are happening with an increasing uh, amount as a result of climate change. Uh, what you see here in this photo is what's known as a tailings dam. Uh, a tailings dam is built to house the byproducts of the mining industry. As a result of mining different metals, there are all kinds of chemical byproducts that are created, and they're basically stored behind a dam forever for all intents and purposes. And sometimes those dams fail, as happened in 2019 uh, in Brazil, 
as a result of this disaster, actually about 230 people were killed and there was massive environmental uh, devastation. And using our soil moisture mapping technology, we're able to assist mining companies to help prevent this kind of thing from happening. Uh, and finally, the last use case I'll mention is uh, using this satellite technology to actually detect where there's lithium beneath the ground. This is something we're able to do by detecting li lithium deposits that are surfacing. Of course, lithium has a key role to play in powering the, uh, the future in terms of electric batteries and electric cars, et cetera. Um, there's a huge global effort underway to increase the amount of lithium being produced. And our technology is already being used to help mining companies find lithium deposits uh, quickly and more efficiently. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to um, give the floor now to Kermit Oran from Salikov, CEO of, of Salikov. Thank you. Can you see my, my slides? No. Jonathan, maybe you should stop sharing. Yes, please. Yes, can we see that? Okay. Yes. yes, yes. Okay, great. So I'm sorry for my voice. I just lost it today and I'll do my best for the next four minutes so you can hear me clearly. Good evening, my name is Karmit Oron and I'm the CEO at Salicrop. At Salicrop, we take uh, the advantage of the, the challenge of looking at what's happening to a crop in open field. So most of our research in the last eight years was actually focused on how do we create more yield under abiotic stress conditions, which means drought, heat and salinity that are now most of the farmers of the world are facing. If we look at the damages that this is creating only in the US, you can see that uh, the government is paying $9 billion a year just for this uh, loss. And eventually, Salicrop has made the vision to focus on how do we grow yield on those uh, abiotic stresses, specifically where the heat is now becoming much more frequent in the early uh, season. Uh, even in Europe. So visionally, we have uh, our mission is to create a sustainable future where every plant strives under stress conditions. Uh, and again, we started our research from salinity and we tackle very high saline soil, very high uh, saline irrigation water. And of course, how do we do that? We actually treat the seeds before they're transplanted or seeded in the fields. Uh, in how, how do we do that? We actually reactivate the stress mechanism in the seeds in a way that we're regulating the plant's gene expression. Of course, with, not, with, non, uh, with a very non-GMO approach, which means we're not changing the genes in any way. What do we create by that? We reactivate the stress mechanism and we create a much more resilient plants that can strive under the stress. I wanted to uh, take the moment to share with you a few of our um, uh, great successes in this season. We have been uh, privileged enough to receive a grant from the Innovation Authority and has started a big project in uh, India with uh, Bayer. We also work with Sakata and the leaders in the category of uh, food processing uh, in Europe, in Middle East and in India. And I can really, uh, and, and this is the numbers from the three, uh, from the last three months. We're not only saying that we're increasing yield in 10, 15%, like we said in the past. Today, we can accumulate that and really uh, talk about real money that we've created, the real income that we've created for the farmers. So in Israel, we're now actively working in more than 1,000 hectares. And we've shown in the last uh, season, this is the last season in Israel, that we can create an additional income under salinity stress and uh, heat stress of all the way uh, to 1,640 euros per hectare, which is amazing. In Israel, we see that uh, the uh, plants are heat, uh, 
in the budding stage, in the uh, food set uh, stage, and we we have been able to support farmers and supporting them by creating between 10 to 15% more yield and eventually additional net income in the band. I wanna show you uh, a use case from Spain, where in Spain we see uh, a land de uh, degradation and huge issues are coming up to the open field. And we've been working closely, this is the second year with the leaders in the category. And I'm showing you a few plots where we've increased yield dramatically from 1,000 uh, euros per hectare all the way to 3,000 uh, euros per hectare. And uh, the size that you see here is how hot this year, 23, was in Spain. Uh, Spain is now uh, suffering from uh, very uh, strong heat waves in the season, in the cultivation season of tomatoes, and it's really uh, decreasing their yields. Uh, something important to understand about Spain, Spain is the fourth uh, producer in the world of processing tomato, which means if their cultivation is harmed, they're losing billions of dollars per year. Another use case to show you is Senegal, where we've actually created an increase of evil 21% with Kagome. So uh, Kagome is one of the leading um, factories producing ketchup and paste in the world. They're Japanese companies. And this year we're already selling to Kagome in Senegal. We've been increasing, as I was saying, 21% increase in yield, which eventually brings the farmer 1,200 euros additional income at the end of the season. So not only talking about general, I think the pathway that we've been doing in the last two years is showing that it's not only R&D, but we're actually creating a commercialization pathway and creating a real net additional income to the farmers that are now suffering from uh, climate change and uh, field challenges uh, in day-to-day -day, uh, cultivation. Salad Club not only works on tomatoes, we work on different crops, vegetables, fodder, uh, rice and others, but I'll be happy to elaborate in another opportunity with a better voice. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Karmi. Um, Your efforts are impressive. Um, okay, so what have we um, shown you today? We could see today that the ecosystem is growing. We have 784 Israeli climate tech. This is an increase from previous report. This is the list we have. We might might uh, didn't see all the companies on the startups. One out, out of six startups established in 2022 are climate tech. $2.3 billion funding for Israel Climate Tech in 2022. And we could see, we could demonstrate the resilience of climate tech um, in comparison with the general Israeli ecosystem in 2022. And let's hope it will continue. And the four leading um, challenges or areas in the climate tech in Israel are clean energy systems, sustainable mobility and transport, climate smart agriculture, and alternative proteins. What do we have to say about this? We say that Israel has yet to exhaust its potential for innovation, commercialization, and scaling up of climate tech solutions. Um, I, I think we can see here the important role of multi-stakeholders played and collaborative approach in the continued growth of the Israeli climate tech ecosystem, private and public sectors. Planet Tech, our collaborator, continues to, to build programs to enhance climate tech expertise in Israel and to accelerate the development and deployment of climate tech through connections between a network of local and global stakeholders and the Israel Innovation Authority is taking on 
active role in driving the climate tech ecosystem forward, identifying specific domains with unique potential, removing the barriers to create a world leading hub and promote global efforts for tackling the unmet needs of the climate crisis. More details you can read in the um, Planetic Report. And by that, I would um, thank you all very much. And I think we don't have questions. Um, I saw one question about the investments. I think we answered it. Um, right, Tamar, Gal. Yes, so uh, thank you, Hagit, and thank you, Tamar, uh, for presenting uh, in a great way uh, the new findings of the report. As Hagit mentioned, uh, we a bit like short on time, so uh, and we also answered the like the one questions in the Q and A uh, chat. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Hagit and Tamar. Thank you, the amazing startups. Thank you, uh, Dror and Shani, and in general, uh, all the audience that uh, join us today uh, to showcase and to learn more about the climate tech ecosystem. Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, the reports you, you you can download the full report in. The Planet Tech website and the, and in the Israel Innovation Authority website, um, so go there, download it, and and uh, go deep in into the, into the details. So thank you very much again, and hope to see you uh, all you all of you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, God, thank you, Planet Tech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.